Welcome to another show of the Divorce at Altitude podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Kalamea. This week, I am joined by Dr. John Zervopoulos. He is a lawyer, a board-certified forensic psychologist, and he helps family lawyers uh, cut through mental health experts' confusing work and testimony and, quite frankly, just make them look better. Uh, he helps divorce lawyers focus their depositions and trial examinations uh, of experts and sharpen their uh, oral and written legal arguments and develop a more compelling case theme. Uh, John uh, obtained his uh, joint JD from SMU. Uh, he has a PhD in counseling um, from the University of North Texas. He's conducted psychological evaluations, counseling, and mediation in over 400 court-appointed forensic cases. He's been qualified as an expert in more than 100 cases, and he's developed uh, the plan model, uh, which we're going to talk about primarily here today in this episode, uh, which is a four-step case law-based tool for divorce lawyers to evaluate mental health uh, professionals' information, specifically with custody evaluations. Here in Colorado, we would uh, refer to those as child and family investigator reports or a parental responsibility evaluations. Uh, John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. This was great, Welcome. great opportunity. Welcome. So anything I missed, I know you wrote a book for the ABA uh, or t a couple books. Uh, what right. Can you tell our listeners what those two books were? Sure. The first book, uh, both of the books are in their second edition. The first book is titled Confronting Mental Health Evidence. Um, and uh, what that book does is set out my plan model. But then from there, it talks about uh, the legal perspective in terms of how you should look at case law and statutes and the like. Uh, and then the psychological perspective that talks about what psychologists bring to the table and what lawyers should be aware of in terms of uh, noting the research in psychological literature and putting that together. And then I have some other chapters specifically written for lawyers on how to deal with various issues that come up in, in an evaluation, uh, testing, uh, domestic violence, um, sexual abuse allegations. Uh, a chapter on DSM-5 and how lawyers can deal with uh, DSM-5, understand that. Uh, and again, it's it's all written specifically for lawyers. It's not just um, a psychology person writing it, but it's how you can use that material. And the second book is How to Examine Mental Health Experts. They kind of go together. That second book is uh, very practical oriented. There's about um, uh, 15 to 20 chapters on various issues that come up in, uh, in examining or deposing a mental health expert. And some of those issues we'll talk about uh, today. But each chapter has uh, a laying out of the issue and then a, a look at the issue from uh, case law and then from psychology's perspective. And then most of the chapters also have suggested examination questions for the um, uh, for the lawyer. And then I talk a little bit about admissibility hearings, Daubert hearings in Colorado, they're Shrek hearings basically, and um, and also uh, how to deal with um, uh, examinations in instructing examination questions and the like. And I've read both books. They're they're uh, very helpful. I think it's helpful for l listeners or important for listeners to know that you're you consult with divorce lawyers and and call and family law uh, uh, lawyers. But I, I think it also is going to be helpful for anyone that may be going through a, a parenting evaluation or they want to understand more about what goes into that process. Uh, in, in addition to just the the lawyers uh, that may be uh, listening, and so in order to kind of set the scene, uh, let's we, we listeners may recognize we we have this hypothetical uh, divorce uh, involving Eric and Melanie Wolf, and they have children, uh, and we we're gonna have a we have a separate episode with an actual um, parental responsibilities evaluator here in Colorado, and they're gonna talk about what goes into a PRE uh, and an evaluation 
uh, from someone that's done that here in Colorado. Uh, and, and so, but what ultimately is produced is a very lengthy report. Uh, and I can remember still as a baby lawyer, when I first got one of these reports, it gets into the history of the relationship. And, and then, you know, at the end, it, it, res, it has conclusions or recommendations. And now as someone who's seen a lot of these, we always, it's like a judge, whenever a judge issues a ruling, um, specifically on final orders, you, as a lawyer, you always scroll through the the to the end and then you just say okay did i win or did i lose or or what are right. the recommendations right uh right, and, right, and right. you know that that's the same thing with the uh, parental responsibilities evaluations so you know we we as divorce lawyers do that uh if eric and melanie if we're you know having a pre uh a parental responsibilities evaluation uh in eric and melanie's uh divorce and then i get a report uh, as Eric's divorce lawyer. Uh, and then I come to you, John, and I say, Hey, I got this report. Uh, it, it's not good for, for Eric Wolf. What are the steps that you, how, how do you approach that report? Is it just that, you know, there's no, uh, w- uh way other than, um, you know, just throwing your hands up and, and saying, w- we agree with the recommendations. Well, how do you approach that? Well, um, let me first put it in, in the context that what we're going to talk about in terms of approach is how I, as a consulting expert, approach it, all right, where I'm looking at it from both um, case law issues as well as the psychological issues and methods that are involved in doing doing the report, all right? But the model that we're talking about is something that all lawyers can use. Uh, sometimes you might not have be able to... Um, retain a consulting expert. But what we set out today is going to be an outline basically for how any lawyer can start taking a part in evaluation in a systematic way. So you get this report, right? You're right to say they're long. Um, They could be like 80 pages, some over that. They're like novellas, right? (laughs) They're not reports, they're novellas. Um, And, um, uh, Let's say you go to the end, as you said, and, and the, um, the recommendations come out in your client's favor and you feel real good about it. You start really sweating when those recommendations don't go in your client's favor. But um, you, should still, you should still sort of be concerned a little bit, at least to look into it if it comes out in your client's, in your client's favor, because maybe the evaluator, what, it, it wasn't pretty the way the eva- evaluator got there right? And so you need to be prepared for what kind of cross is going to come your way if, um, uh, if that's the case. So my recommendation first is to grab a cup of coffee and sit down and just read through the report. No notations or what have you. You already know the recommendations. And um, maybe have a, a pencil or pen and note a couple of paragraphs or key sentences that talk in favor of your client because you may be able to use that later on to anchor your examinations all right but nothing more than that just sit back and start just read through through the report get a sense of it and number one you'll get a sense of the writing style Uh, you'll get a sense that the evaluator kind of knows what they're talking about um, and, uh, and you also will sort of get a sense of whether the report itself leading up to the recommendations matches the recommendations. Sometimes we may find that the report seems to be tooling along in your client's favor, and suddenly there's a, a veer off to the left when it comes to the recommendations. It doesn't make sense how they got there, right? So sit back, read through it and then get that sense of what the uh, evaluator is saying. And now you're ready then to jump into analyzing. So in, in we had a, another uh, lawyer, Jim Bailey, uh, talk about prenups and how marital agreements, how he would, what he called polishing the stone. He would read the agreement and then just continue to read it a- again and again, and you pull out different things. Is that a similar process to how you approach these uh, mental health uh, reports? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, again, just read it first, and then we'll talk the, about a model and our plan model in terms of how to polish it, how to uh, take out from from what you need and what the report is saying. You know, the, one of the problems is, is that lawyers sometimes, because they get overwhelmed with the amount of information, uh, they don't address the report in a systematic way. They start going through the report and start cherry picking various issues but they can't put it together in a whole, either from addressing it from the psychologist's point of view or tying it to legal arguments that they need to make uh, for the court. So you mentioned the plan. What, that's an acronym. What, what is, John, what does PLAN stand for and, and walk us through uh, those uh, steps? Well, my uh, practice is called Psychology Law Partners. And I developed that name several years ago because the focus of my consulting is not just providing the lawyer with psychological feedback, but also tying it to the legal cases and legal issues that are a part of the case that you're working on. And of course, in Colorado, we're dealing with uh, case law involving experts and also the statutes around PREs and the like. And um, and so the plan model is psychology law, that's PL, analysis model, A-N, all right? So plan model. And um, there's an underlying question that, um, that accompanies the plan model. And that question is, how do you know what you say you know, all right? How do you know what you say you know? And, and lawyers have to keep that at the top of their mind as they're going through the report and every other instance in which they're interacting with the work of the expert or taking a deposition or examination question and the like. And really, that is really the focus of the Dahlberg cases and the Shrek cases and, and other cases uh, nationally. Um, the, ex, the court isn't supposed to just take it just because the expert says it's so. They have to show their homework. and. Asking how do you know what you say you know is the foundational question to um, to uh, starting to take systematically take apart and understand the evaluation. And the underlying uh, assumption, or not assumption, but the the guiding light is reliability, right? Uh, and so, how do you uh, break down an a PRE? Uh, in in figuring out how they know what they know, and as you say, as well as determining whether or not the opinion is or the report is reliable. Well, um, we're talking about reliability, right? And sometimes that word is used almost kind of a clinical sense. Everyone has their own notion. It's it's burdened by all this case law and so forth. But Daubert has a nice synonym for reliability. It says evidentiary reliability equates to trustworthiness, right? So the question is, ultimately, is what the expert saying trustworthy? And in my view, as you go through taking apart the evaluation through these steps, uh, you have to, as you ask the how do you know what you say, you know, question, uh, you're thinking about how is what the expert saying, can we trust this? Can the court trust this testimony? If you take that track, then all the legal arguments for reliability in the case law follow along as well. So there are four steps to my plan model, and each step should be taken sequentially. You start with uh, step one, which is qualifications. Step two, which is dealing with methods, how the expert developed their data. Step three is, is conclusions, how the expert developed their conclusion. That's reasoning reliability. And step four is the opinions and recommendations, pulling all the previous three steps together. Each step has a basis in both uh, case law and in psychology's research literature and uh, research and literature. And so, uh, in essence, one could theoretically have a, a motion to exclude on any one of those steps. Uh, but as, as you'll see as we go through this um, and take this apart, uh, you can uh, really find the strengths and weaknesses of the evaluation and whether it's sufficiently trustworthy for the court to, uh, to accept it.
Okay, so step one, the the expert's qualifications. So would an example, Eric Wolf, let's say that he's dealing with a, a, a relocation. You, you're based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, if Melanie Wolf in our hypothetical wants to relocate with the children to Texas, what are the qualifications or things in terms of step one that you are looking at in that PRE or CFI's uh, CV or background? Well, the first thing is um, what are the training and work experiences of the expert? Okay. Um, look to the CV and look to the website as well, right? The CV is really kind of the brochure for the expert. They're not gonna put stuff that's negative or what have you in their CV. They're trying to, uh, you know, most of the time legitimate, legitimately show the court what their background is, what they have. But, you know, as we all may do at certain points, they may be puffing certain qual uh, qualifications, right? And so you need to go to the CV almost line by line to check out their training and experience. And also keep in mind that uh, different mental health experts bring to the table different experiences. A psychologist, for example, has um, uh, you know, done graduate school, maybe four years in graduate school that emphasizes testing, assessment, psychopathology, so on and so forth and then write a dissertation. A master's level person may have two years of graduate school where uh, just a semester or two may be devoted to the kind of skills that might be required for a particular evaluation. So you need to sort of look at the referral question, relocation, for example, and the case facts, and then decide what kind of uh, qualifications are, are required for the, um, uh, for the PRE, all right? The second thing is to look at the specialties that the expert claims, all right? Uh, does the expert have any specialty in issues related to relocation, for example? That might not disqualify them, but if they don't have that sort of expertise, you may call into question the kind of conclusions uh, and opinions they have a little bit later. Do they know the research and the like? Uh, usually, particularly on the website, experts will list specialties. Uh, in a deposition, you might want to go through uh, the specialties they list and ask them, how did you gain the specialty? Or are you just putting it there? And you may get a lot of information that might be helpful later on, particularly for crossing uh, the uh, expert to uh, see if they're puffing, for example, their opinions and so forth. And the third thing to look at in step one is what professional organizations do they belong to? Most psychologists will belong to the American Psychological Association. And if they're doing PREs, um, they will also uh, probably belong to AFCC or the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, all right? If they don't, and if they're not psychologists, they'll usually belong to AFCC. And Colorado has a, an AFCC chapter, right? If they don't belong to organizations like that, you know, it sort of calls into question their commitment to, you know, what they're doing, particularly if they are um, uh, frequently doing these kinds of evaluations. But these organizations also produce guidelines that uh, you can make use of later. Uh, APA, American Psychological Association, has guidelines for child custody evaluations for forensic psychology. AFCC has guidelines for child custody evaluations, brief focused evaluations and so forth. And these are, you can make the legal argument that these are sort of generally accepted practices. And, and then even if the expert might try to, um, you know, say that, well, they don't have to follow their guidelines. Well, you can still make to the court the general acceptance and peer review quality of those particular guidelines. So you look at the training, you look at the specialties that the expert claims, and then you look at what professional organizations they belong to, primarily for the purpose of seeing what guidelines you can hold them to later on. And would an example be, there, I had a case, of, you know, a war story, that a case of CFI, a child and family investigator was an attorney, really young, you know, attorney, uh, and the the CFI didn't interview 
uh, a significant other that was living in the household. And it seemed to be, it was a critical witness and component of the case. And the judge just summarily discarded the, uh, the recommendations by the CFI because the, the, the kind of methodology, which we're going to get into, but would it, uh, the AFCC have regulations or guidelines on what witnesses they interview and what we call what you call collaterals, the various steps that you need to go through. And if there's, uh, an oversight or, or a shortfall in those guidelines, then you can really highlight the, uh, lack of, of qualifications because they didn't follow uh, the or may not be familiar with those those guidelines. Is that an example? That may be uh, too much in the weeds for those standards and guidelines. Certainly those guidelines will uh, say that you need to um, connect and make touch base with collateral sources, either people and also looking at records and so forth. But oftentimes statutes, uh, for example, in Texas, um, uh, detail what collateral sources you need to look at. And that may also sort of be true in Colorado. I've forgotten that. But, uh, but the fact of the matter is that if, and we'll get into the methods in, in a little bit, if they don't deal with the collateral source, particularly significant collateral sources when they're doing the evaluation, the question comes up as to whether um, they can really support their opinions, right, based on the fact that they didn't consider some pretty significant data that they should have considered. And certainly you can um, examine the, that expert on the limitations of their um, opinion uh, based on um, uh, whether or not they contact that collateral source and if their opinion might be different if, um, if they had known about that collateral source. You know, that kind of question is a win-win question, right? Uh, if it was different, yeah. If they say it wasn't different, then you can show by the significance of that source that the expert is um, really kind of doubling down inappropriately on their opinions. Yeah, and I jumped the gun in terms of that example uh, because that takes us into step two, which is the determining the method, the reliability of the methods. Can you explain to our listeners what, what's step two of the plan model? Step two has to deal with uh, what I call methods reliability. All right. That's kind of the ultimate. That's what Daubert was initially emphasizing, you know, is the, what about the methodology and, and other sort of related cases. The way I break that down is I consider two frameworks, the conceptual framework, that is what's your goal and how do you put together what, uh, what you want as an attorney in terms of, uh, of, of evaluating whether the expert looked at the best interest of the child appropriately. And the second is the practical framework, which I'll get to in a second, and that's the actual methodology. The conceptual framework is basically a, uh, a best interest, a nice best interest framework, right? It, it's three-pronged. It comes from the American Psychological Association's Child Custody Guidelines, uh, which are, by the way, uh, being in the process of being revised right now. I hope that guideline stays in, right? But um, it says that evaluations should consider three things. The parenting fit, um, that is the strengths and weaknesses, the abilities, deficiencies of the parent. The needs, psychological and developmental needs of the child, and the resulting fit, okay? What I tell lawyers is, um, you know, oftentimes the best interest argument is pulling from so many different sources because case law and statutes are looking at a bunch of different factors that it seems kind of difficult sometimes to pull it all together to make your argument. But here, if you can make your argument and see how the evaluator has looked at the parenting issues, the child issues, and the resulting fit, that's a very nice three-part best interest argument, right? And you make your arguments on, that, um, on those three prongs, and then you get into fitting in the best interest factors that, you know, that the statute and so forth will do. On top of that, 
when I was talking before about how you might read through an evaluation, then suddenly get to the, you know, the 95 pages of, of the report, and then pages 96 and 97 come up with recommendations that go against what seemed to be um, flowing in the previous 95 pages. Well, that's the resulting fit part, right? Uh, and so there's different ways, nice ways of using that conceptual framework. So after you get your goal there and, and kind of get a sense of um, how you're going to present the issue of the best interest, then you look at the um, methodology that the, that the expert uses. It's what I call the practical framework. And I have a basically a three-prong uh, metaphor for that. It's what I call the three-legged footstool, all right? And you can, or, you can use that to organize your thinking as, as a lawyer uh, and also use that as a metaphor to the court, right? You have the footstool that is the evaluation. And if you're going to have a stable footstool, each leg has to be strong. If one of the legs are a little bit weak, then the footstool may wobble. If two of them are weak, then the footstool may wobble more or just kind of fall apart. So um, that's, a, that's a very helpful metaphor to, uh, for us to deal with. So what are those, what are those legs, right? Uh, the first leg is interviews. Um, the uh, generally accepted evaluation has the evaluator interviewing the parents and the children and seeing the parents and the children together, all right? So did the evaluator did the evaluator only interview the parents one time, twice in a complicated relocation case that you talked about before, or did they interview uh, the uh, parents several times to get a better sense of what the arguments are for and against and so forth? All right. The second leg is testing and questionnaires in a psych with a psychologist. If a psychologist is doing the PRE, um, the testing will involve what kind of testing was used. How was it used? Why was it used? How were the results interpreted? Uh, I also put questionnaires there because um, most evaluators will have parents fill out questionnaires. But I put it in the second um, leg rather than the first leg because sometimes evaluators will use questionnaires as a substitute for interviews. Uh, well, I'm going to ask the same question, I get the information. Well, questionnaires can be extremely helpful. But where do parents fill out their questionnaires? At their kitchen table, maybe with a cup of coffee, maybe with a glass of wine, maybe with someone else helping them fill it out. Interviews are different. Uh, you can ask the same questions in interviews, but if you want, if the evaluator wants to elaborate on an answer, they can do that. Or, you know, if this doesn't make sense, how do you, what do you make of that? And ask those kinds of questions. So testing and questionnaires are in the second uh, leg. And the third leg is collateral sources, kind of what you were talking about before. You know, who are the collateral sources that were um, uh, contacted? Um, when were they contacted? That's important because sometimes evaluators might contact collateral sources at the end of the evaluation, uh, right before they're going to write it. In a sense, they're sort of like checking the box off of their evaluation methods. So they're not really using the collateral sources to give them information for their interviews, right? And of the parties. Um, and so um, that can be an issue, or maybe they haven't read appropriate records, documents, depositions, and the like. So those are the three legs. Um, you can also use that, uh, before I move on, as a way of taking an x-ray of the evaluation. Let's turn each one of those legs into three bins, okay? Now, at the beginning of a report, usually on pages two and three, there's a listing of all the methodology that the experts use, okay? Interviewed mom on this date, dad on this date, saw the kids on that date, uh, called the teachers on this date, so on and so forth. Well, go through each line and put that line into one of the bins. If it's an interview, put it in the interview bin. If it's testing, testing. If it's a collateral source, put it in the collateral source bin. And pretty soon you have sort of a, um, a, a, a picture, an x-ray, so to speak, 
of what happened with those methods and the evaluation. A recent evaluation that I worked with a lawyer on, the um, evaluator turned in a fairly long report. Uh, and um, I mean, the methodology was, um, you know, two pages, but she'd only interviewed the parents one time. Uh, she did some testing, but in, in a sense, what she did was did a record review. And that was her evaluation. And it, the evaluation report, the x-ray comes out real clear once you can put each one of those methods in its appropriate bin. And I think in terms of you really uh, highlight or magnify this three stool uh, metaphor when you have competing evaluators. So there's a PRE yes. and then a supplemental PRE. You have a CFI and then a, PR, a PRE. Uh, right. And you then look at, for example, a CFI in Colorado, they, they can't do psychological testing, but they may have somebody else do the psychological testing or ask uh, for that. And that might substitute for that or or provide that, that second stool. But it, going back to what you were originally, the, the, the kind of beginning is that if you read the report uh, and you it doesn't go that your, your way, um, you then start looking at, are there some shortcomings in one of the stools and how strong are each one of those legs of the stool? But if it, if it goes, you know, in your favor, you also go through that same analysis because it could be if, if, it, even if the recommendations are in your clients' favor, if you know that the, uh, just it's, it, they didn't do a, a very good job and there's two stools that are weak, they didn't interview the collaterals or they didn't do psychological testing for a PRE that there might be some some issues that you need to uh, address or sure or shore up or if if you're the lawyer in that case as, as you were describing right what and let's say the interviews were pretty strong but they didn't do a lot on the collateral part or the testing was was just kind of perfunctory right then you really want to focus on the interviews, right? You're not going to say a whole lot about the footstool then. You're just going to say, well, this is what they told me. And, um, and, uh, and this really kind of bears out with how I view them. I interviewed them several times and so on and so forth. So if you're on the end, if you're on the end of the, of the scale where the evaluator didn't do a great job and one of those legs of the footstool uh, or maybe two of them are particularly weak, well, you want to organize your examination around the strongest leg and and then uh, develop your story from there. And that's, that's sort of, again, uh, the beauty of using these sort of metaphors. Again, rather than cherry picking through an evaluation, uh, you've got different aspects you could look at. You have the x-ray of the evaluation. You can see where the evaluation is strong and not so strong and really kind of orient the examination uh, around uh, the strength of the evaluation uh, where, um, where, I mean, where you can see you've analyzed where things are strong and maybe less strong. Yeah, I think it's helpful to have that analytical framework because most lawyers, or at least I can speak from experience, when I first got these evaluations, they're court appointed. A lot of judges, it's just like, well, whatever, they're an extension. This evaluator is an extension of the court and they're going to give recommendations and I'm just going to go ahead and follow those. But there are circumstances, there are good and bad evaluations. And, and uh, when you get into uh, the, the kind of check the box, you know, when you talked about collaterals, right. you and right. I worked on a case where the uh, report was pretty much written and then the evaluator started calling the collaterals and it was pretty clear that they had made up their mind, which raises, you know, the confirmation bias and some of the other biases that right. you identify in your uh, book. Can you talk a little bit about some of those bias, you know, the the common um, biases that people well, if I, uh, or if evaluators I can, are susceptible to? Yeah, if I can put that in context a little bit, because that's part of step three. 
And so that's a nice segue into step three. All right. So uh, before I talk specifically about the biases, let me talk about uh, what the elements are of step three and what the goal is for the lawyer in step three. Step three is uh, the conclusions and the uh, what I call reasoning reliability. All right. And here I want to distinguish between conclusions and opinions, all right? Conclusions are social science-based, psychology-based. Mom is depressed. Uh, well, how do we get that? Let's go through our footstool. In the interview, she was very weepy. She seemed very sad. She says she doesn't sleep um, and so forth. In the testing, the depression scale on her MMPI is elevated. And the collateral people that I contacted talked about mom always feeling sad and depressed. Okay, so. I make the conclusion there that she's depressed, all right? Opinions are different. That's step four, where opinions are and recommendations are really applying the conclusions to the legal standard, best interest of the child and so forth. For example, a mom could be very depressed, but that doesn't mean she should uh, have less time with her child, right? So you have to distinguish those two. So, um, the important word to keep in mind here in step three is the word inference, all right? And what does inference mean? It's not just something that's subjective. A dictionary, determ a dictionary definition of inference is a conclusion based on evidence and reasoning, okay? Where do we get the evidence by uh, step three? Well, we've got it from a competent evaluator, step one, doing the methodology in step two, developing the data and considering the case facts. And that's the evidence that they will bring into step three, all right? But what kind of reasoning are they applying now to come to their conclusions? And um, experts will oftentimes kind of uh, sidestep the reasoning saying, well, they're following the research, the research says this and so on and so forth. But every conclusion, again, is or is based on the evidence that you have and the reasoning that you how you put that together. All right, um, Nassim Taleb, he's a stockbroker who's done done a lot of writing and so forth. He wrote a great book. Ah, oh, gosh, I think 2005. It's called uh, "Fooled by Randomness," and he has a great quote on it in, in that book. I think it's on page 72, if I'm remembering. Uh, I'm really not this much of a nerd, Ryan, but that quote is great. And he says, science lies in the rigor of the inference. Science lies in the rigor of the inference. And remember the de dictionary defini de definition, evidence plus reasoning. And case law actually also supports that, okay? Joyner's analytical gap theory says that basically a court may conclude that there is simply too great an analytical gap between the data and the opinion proffered, all right? And that gap is the inferences, right? And so there's always inference involved in any decision, conclusion that's there. A quick tip, if you are on direct, what you wanna do, keeping that analytical gap metaphor in mind, you wanna try to make that gap as narrow as possible, right? On cross, you wanna try to make that gap as wide as possible. So what do experts do uh, to um, hide the wide gaps in their, um, in their uh, uh, opinions, all right? First, they may misrepresent research. Uh, either they'll cherry pick research or uh, pick inappropriate studies to try to make their point and the like, and that can be a big problem. But the second issue is biases, all right? And there are uh, several biases that uh, experts may fall prey to. One might be confirmation bias, and that's where they make their, um, uh, their judgment real early, right? And then all the data and case facts is kind of funneled through that judgment until at the end, they come up with their opinions and recommendations, right? So would an example be that a mom is the better, is a superior parent to the the father uh, in that that evaluation, everything is done through the lens that a mom must be uh, better than a father? 
Absolutely. That's a great example. Um, and there are just so many different ways that experts might come into a situation, right? Uh, being uh, sometimes not even realizing it with a bias that colors their uh, assessment of the data and the case facts. Uh, there's hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is when you look back and try to make things more perfect than they really are. Okay, life is messy. Things happen in life, even in evaluations, right? Uh, usually if an evaluation is ordered, there's been some messiness in the family and maybe messiness in the way the family is coming apart, right? So um, how does the evaluator assess that messiness? Does he get into the messiness and try to look at it in the context in which it happened? Or does he look back right now and try to think, well, they shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done that. And suddenly the um, uh, he's trying to make a perfect world for uh, the examinees when no one lives in a perfect world, right? And judge the person in that way. There may be what's called availability bias. And that's what I call top of mind bias. Uh, and top of mind bias is let's say the evaluator has been to, done a lot of reading on issues of uh, domestic violence or, or even in our example in uh, relocations, all right? and maybe even um, uh, attended some workshops on that. But rather than looking at each evaluation on its own merits and its own facts, maybe they are using some information they got there and suddenly because it's top of mind, they're coming to quick conclusions based on that and then again, funneling the data and so forth. So, um, we always need to be aware of that. Why? Again, because all of our decisions, all of our thinking, even if we're not evaluators, you know, are, gov are based on inferences. Science lies in the rigor of the inference. Well, how do you, con how do you, how should the evaluator combat that uh, bias? I talk about um, in my writing, uh, what I call the bias buster, all right? And the bias buster is having the evaluator consider reasonable alternative explanations of the, um, of the data as they are collecting the data, okay? What does that do? It keeps the evaluator continuing to ask the question, does this fit, does it not fit? Maybe a, a piece of data comes in and it forces the evaluator on a different path in terms of questioning, all towards the goal of trying to get data and understand the data. And if they can continually uh, ask for reasonable alternative explanations of the data that they're looking at, then really what the opinion comes out at the end is the best explanation, the best inference, evidence plus reasoning, right? That explains the data and predicts for the future in terms of the recommendations. Well, I think that's a uh, great segue into our fourth uh, step of the plan model. And can you talk about the opinions and recommendations? Because ultimately, that's what we scroll down and, 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 and read. So uh, what, what, how does that fit in with the plan model? And what are we uh, looking for? Well, one of the things that you want to look for, and keep in mind, by the time we get to step four, uh, we've already gone through steps one, two, and three. So it all kind of culminates in step four, right? Each one of those steps, again, can be addressed by specific legal case law, as well as professional uh, standards in research and literature. So the first thing you look at, do the recommendations really flow from the rest of the report? Remember what I talked about in terms of the conceptual model before, the parenting issues, um, abilities and deficits, the uh, child's developmental and psychological needs, and the resulting fit, right? If the recommendations do not show a resulting fit from everything that's come before, then there's a problem there. And that's something to look into. Another issue is, uh, are the rec recommendations practical? Sometimes lawyers will find that evaluations, that recommendations are you know, we talked before about checking you know, checking off the boxes, right? Some of the 
recommendations may be just cookie cutter recommendations, right? Each parent has to go to therapy. Well, that's in every evaluation, right? Uh, what does that mean that each has to go to therapy? What kind of therapist does that person need? What kind of goals should the person should the person work towards in therapy? That's more of the kind of recommendation is thought through, right? Um, also, the recommendations need to be practical. Too many times I see in evaluations where there are lists of recommendations. You know, there's only 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And to follow all of those recommendations, it's like it would take four hours every day and the kids in school, six of those hours. There's no way that those recommendations can be followed, right? Um, but yet they are there. They haven't been thought through. So it has to, those recommendations have to be looked in, in in kind of an intentional way by the evaluator, all right? And then I guess the final thing I'd want to say is um, a definition of recommendations. I think that the best definition of recommendations that I've seen anywhere is in guideline 13 of the APA's um, uh, child custody ev evaluation guidelines, all right? And again, I hope it's still there when they revise it. But let me read that if I could, uh, what that definition is, and see if what you see in this definition kind of outlines what we've talked about uh, up till now in terms of the four steps. Okay, here we go. Recommendations are based upon articulated assumptions, interpretations, and inferences that are consistent with established professional and scientific standards. Okay, articulated assumptions, interpretations, and inferences that are consistent with established professional and scientific standards. All right, that covers both the methodology and the reasoning, and being consistent with established professional and scientific standards also covers the, the legal necessities, what's required for reliable, trustworthy testimony from the court's point of view. And I think that, that it's so helpful John, for you to provide a, a framework, because oftentimes, and even during this own episode, I've I've done it myself, where you mix and match, and you just get kind of overwhelmed. Because these right. reports, when you're reading DSM, you know MMPI, it, right. and it's it's this technical terms enmeshment and and other things that uh, you know it's not really taught in normal law school curriculums. Come on, Brian, where did you go really, to law school? <laughs> right. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it can be completely overwhelming. Judges, I think, have a hard time understanding it and they just look at it and they say, well, I'm just going to follow the recommendations right. um, or, and without really understanding what all is going in. Uh, John, it, you which know, you've which, helped uh, me. If I could, if I could just, sure. which, which takes us back full circle to uh, what we talked about before. And that is our primary question. How do you know what you say you know? If the expert is coming across with these abstractions and these jargonese and so forth, how do you know what you say you know? Asking them to take that apart for you is the best way of trying to get underneath that. Right. And I think maybe if you can do that yourself, great. If an attorney needs help, uh, they can turn to a consultant like you uh, to really do that for them um, and, and help their client uh, ask, how do you know what you think you know when looking at some of these uh, reports? Because most people will say that the, the child custody, the parenting issues are the most important. You know, In my experience, parental relocations people, they, they go to trial, they will have multiple experts, people will uh, it, it virtually bankrupt themselves uh, fighting over these. And, and these important questions uh, are, uh, they need to be asked it, to help families move forward. So for lawyers or, or other people, I, you're not a testifying expert, you don't do uh, forensic, you don't do uh, PREs anymore in Colorado or, uh, you know, but you help lawyers uh, pick apart or shore up 
uh, these uh, parental responsibilities evaluations or examination outlines. Where can people find more information uh, from uh, about you, John, if if they uh, want to, you know, buy your book or or follow your your blog? And where can people find uh, more about you? Well, the best way to do that is just go to my website, and it's at www.psychologylawpartners. That's plural. dot com. www.psychologylawpartners.com. And uh, there at the website, it uh, explains what I do, why I do it, the different services that I provide, and and also uh, a link to an archive of uh, the last 18 months of my newsletter that I send out um, twice a month. And those newsletters are uh, offering lawyers tips on how to deal with mental health experts, their work, and their testimony. And I know, I mean, you're a prolific writer, John. I, I know that your most recent uh, newsletter was about tying the legal arguments and the, the recommendations uh, to the legal arguments. Uh, and you and I are going to be presenting at the upcoming Family Law Institute for Colorado uh, divorce lawyers uh, in August. Uh, I look forward to uh, doing that presentation with you. And Thanks so much for taking the time to join us at Divorce Altitude. I think that that was uh, very informative and helpful for people that are going through a, a child custody evaluation or lawyers uh, presented with uh, a PRE or a CFI uh, report and asking themselves, how, how do I look at this uh, in uh, now and in the future? So thanks so much, Sean, for joining us. And thank you so much, Ryan, for letting me be on with you. It was fun. We'll have you on again. Thanks. All right.